enough money to help like pay for bills and like um, pay for school. That's how I pay for college. Man, that's a that's a hustle. So yeah. anybody listening to this right now, zero excuse. You just gave that. Might, I've heard a lot of wild stuff on this podcast, man. That might be one of the the most hustleless, 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 hustle thing I've ever heard on this podcast. And you know what crazy thing is? I almost I almost didn't go back to school. If he could do it, if he could do it, this isn't a movie. He believed in himself, and you can too. Oh man, you're gonna put it on me like that? You can do anything that that you want. You can get singing lessons, get a better job, make more money. You could be even like rich. Could live in the White House someday. You could be president. Me? Do what you want to do. It's not up to other people. It's true. It's up to you. What is up, fam? I'm Dr. Dale, the author of How to Raise a Doctor Wisdom from Parents Who Did It, the author of Black Men and White Coats, the author of Pre Med Mondays, the author of the Doctor Doc Children series, and the author of A Doctor's Guide to Self Publishing. Look in the links below. We give out a lot of free copies, so I might have a free copy link down look below or grab it on Amazon. Aces to the Black Men and White Coats podcast, the place where clinicians have the platform to share their stories with listeners like you. Super excited. We're about to have a story today. I'm telling you, we're about to have a story today. Y'all gonna love it. Y'all gonna say I got no excuses in life not to not to go after your dreams, <laughs> your dreams. It's gonna be a story. Before I introduce this young gentleman, young physician, young genius, I want to remind you guys of two important things. Two important things. Number one, we're paying for MCATs. I'm gonna keep on saying that we're paying for MCATs. I got to take advantage of this, right? We got the money in the bank. Money in the that bank. Means. I don't know some of y'all young bucks might not remember T Pain, but it's got something to say. I got money in the bank. I think that might be T Pain. I don't know, but whatever. We got some money in the bank. We want to give it to you all to pay for your MCAT. All right. Um, and shout out to the people who have donated the funds. Uh, big shout out to uh, Miss Darling Dawson who gave um, a decent chunk of change to help pay for you all's MCATs. And that Aaron Dawson is her son. Some of y'all know Aaron. Um, he's big in black men and white coats as well. All right. That's number one. So it's going to be a link below. Get on there, click on that link out the form and we want to help y'all get through y'all's MCATs. Number two is the Black Men and White Coat Summits. We're getting them on and popping again. We're getting them on and popping again. All right. So right now we have about 20 summits lined up for the course of the next year across the country. We'll put the list out soon so y'all can see if we're coming to your city. We're going to keep on getting more of these summits. So make sure you're on our email list so you guys know when Black Men and White Coats is coming to your city, get involved with the summit. We are trying to raise the next generation and make a huge impact on society. All right. Now, with all that said, you guys are here today for a special guest. It's going to be a good story, man. I've got, um, right off the bat, I'll just tell you, you know, the guy's a neurosurgeon. The guy's neurosurgery, right? Uh, you don't see that very often. You don't see very many black men in neurosurgery. So right, right off the bat, you know this is going to be special. You're going to want to hear this story. His name is Dr. Aaron Palmer. Dr. Aaron Palmer has done some phenomenal stuff. I'm not going to tell you, but we're going to get into it. But you want to stick around and listen to it. What's up, my guy? How you doing? What's going on? I appreciate the invite. I'm happy to be on the show. I, I mean, I look at the content you guys put out. I think it's phenomenal. Um, I really wish there was something like that when I was going through, um, you know, some of the obstacles and we'll talk about. But I'm really excited to be on the show. Excited to be here. Um, love what Black Men and White Coats is doing. So. Now, I appreciate you. Appreciate you. And I'm, I'm going to say, man, the hair looking fly, too. Uh, you got, oh, you know, yeah. You know, the braids. OK, show the spider. OK, looking fly. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. Always. Yeah. Well, yeah. at least now, now that, you know, you know how it is in medicine. Yeah, I'm, I'm long gone, so I can't do that anymore, man. I'm long, my hair is long gone, but that's okay. Well, that's I still okay. have it, I'll do it. Yeah, do it as long, as long as they'll last, man. But, you know, really appreciate you. So, you know, we're going to dive into your story. And um, first thing I'm just going to say is kudos to you because, you know, um, some people don't realize how challenging it is to get into neurosurgery and to, and you know, to get into it, you know, to stay in it to go in there and, and literally cut on someone's brain, someone's spine. That's a big deal. So shout out to you. Kudos to you. When they say, you, you know, I appreciate hey, it. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to do it. You're really a brain surgeon. So you can say, well, I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm like the least brain surgeon of all the brain surgeons I think you'll ever meet. So um, I really think, I mean, we do phenomenal stuff. We have really the, the greatest patients. They, they're really ones that, you know, have to go through all the surgeries, put them through and, and really, um, you know, make the best outcomes. But um, no, I'm blessed to have great mentors, be able to do what I do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still climbing the mountain, but I'm on my way. 
Yeah, you're climbing it and you're bringing a whole lot of people with you. And we'll get into that as well. But all right, so let's get into your story. And, um, you know, I want to dig way back because you got a lot of great stuff. But I want to dig way back. I'm going to go before okay. you. We're going to talk about your parents because even okay. your your dad came from a background where, you know, he had to hustle, struggle to, to, to make things happen, right? And I'm sure you learned so much from that. So before we get into you, I want to see what kind of foundation you got from your father's history. Tell me a little bit about your dad. So my dad and like my my dad was like a huge and still is. I mean, unfortunately, he passed, but he was always like a huge. Um, I would say just a father figure for me. Obviously, he's my dad, but he he shared as a father figure for our for our neighborhood. Um, he grew up in Alabama. He was a sharecropper. And a lot of people don't know what um, the sharecropping system is. So. Um, after they abol abolished slavery, it wasn't like all the slaves could just leave the plantation. I mean, they were free to go, but they didn't have anywhere to live. They didn't have any job. Um, they didn't have any money and their family members still lived on the plantation. So um, ultimately, the plantation owners uh, made a quote unquote deal with them to, um, you know, rent them their housing, which is really a shack with a dirt floor, um, rent them food and allow them to work on their field. And they, they called them share problems. They're sharing the profit, but they, are, they always remained in debt. Um, they, I mean, they were, like I said, they were, they were dirt poor. They lived in, you can go on like ABC, um, history and see some of the, the, the homes they lived in. Um, but anyway, my dad's family, um, in that sharecropping system and that lasted till people seem like, oh, well, slavery was so long ago. The sharecropping system lasted until 1955. Um, and anyhow, so my dad's family, they moved up to Northeast Ohio, Akron, Ohio. Um, there was like this huge, it's called the Great Migration. And I'm here in Chicago now, uh, uh, Northwestern. I think Emma Till's family was part of that Great mi Migration up from the South, up to the Midwest for jobs. Um, so anyway, my dad moved to, uh, with well, his family moved to Northeast Ohio because that's where all the uh, rubber, the rubber companies, they're the rubber capital of the world, you know, in the 50s or whatever, because Goodrich, um, uh, Bridgestone and, and Goodyear all had their headquarters there. But so my dad, he never went to college. He didn't have a high school education. Um, he was in the military. He went into the Marines, went into the Navy. So he's a very, you know, strong um, foundation uh, sort of man. He's a man of very few words, but um, he raised my family and a really small, like we lived in like a, like a poor community in uh, Northeast Ohio. Um, and he raised our entire family in like this, this, uh, all seven of us in this two bedroom home and in our neighborhood, I mean, we didn't have a lot of dads there. So he served as like a father figure for our entire neighborhood, honestly. Um, and you know, he would be, he would, when I was younger, he'd always carry a gun on him. So that's why a lot of people respected him. Um, but you know, he that's would go out crap. and break off, you know, especially being in the hood, man, there were people fighting for all kinds of reasons. And my dad would go out there and like break up a fight. And that, a lot of people respected that, even though it was, you know, he was, you know, people thought he was kooky. He, people always respected all the community work he would do. And he would go out, like, even when I was younger, he'd go and cause like things break in um, people's house and they can't afford to get it fixed, like appliances. So he'd go fix appliances, washers, dryers. He'd go fix on their cars and things like that. Um, and even, he even started a, uh, a, a football association, like a Pee Wee Bantam football association. He helped oh, nice. organize that for um, kids in like elementary school, middle school uh, to play football, give them some structure. And I was a part of that. And so were a lot of kids in Akron. So um, that's just a little, little bio of him. And I, like I said, I owe kind of everything that, you know, from a moral stand, standpoint uh, to him because he, he was such a strong um, moral based man. And I, I really appreciated it. So, I mean, so it wasn't perfect, but uh, it, was, it was definitely a role model. Let, let, yeah, let's dive into that a little bit more because I think that's important because, you know, a big part of why we do Black Men and White Coast, people think, oh, you're doing it just because you want to get, um, you know, Black men to become doctors. Yeah, that's part of it, right? But, nice, yeah, yeah but, but really, a huge part of it is, is showing the Black man as a role model um, and as a contributor to society and as an influencer in society as somebody, Absolutely. Um, as somebody who, who has a pivotal role in the community to help raise the next generation. The Black woman, too, of course, no doubt. But the black man is often overlooked in this whole thing, right? The whole idea about fathers on their homes, whatever. So a big part of what we do, black men and white coast, is this idea of let's promote black men to be great family men, to be there for your communities. Let's demonstrate that. So what you just described to me is your dad being that type of role model we're talking about. As a child, as a boy, when you saw your dad doing those things, what lessons, what stayed with you over the years to help you become who you are? Because it's not like I said, it's not easy to become a neurosurgeon. So something put that foundation. To stay I mean, with. to be honest with you, when I was younger, I didn't even notice it. 
I like obviously I noticed that he was one of the few fathers we had and he did a bunch of stuff like he would fix on people's cars and stuff and he's like you know Aaron come over here, let me teach him I'm like no nah, I'm gonna play basketball I, so I mean <laughs> I definitely appreciate it, but it didn't hit me it really didn't um it wasn't until like I started getting older and I started to see exactly how much impact he had like so when I was younger he'd do like little things whatever and like break up a fight and I'd come down like I said we had a small home I'd come down the staircase and be a drunk guy on our couch that he had gone up like try to break up a fight so there wasn't a domestic violence abuse and whatever or the cops called and so he just did little stuff like that all the time it wasn't really until um I got into college and I, I luckily just got in college to play football, but it wasn't until um, I got into college, I actually had an opportunity to see a doctor um, that I was able to see like, oh, this, this is a strong black man. He's strong academically. People look up to him. He's just like this. I don't know. I didn't really see a lot of that. He, he, just made, he was like a pillar in the community for me. So you, like I just met this guy. Are you saying you hadn't seen a black male doctor so you got to college? So I got to college. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, we never went to we never went to the doctor. My brother, um, my brother is legally blind. We didn't know that until he uh, had to take an exam, like state legally uh, exam to go to, co to go to high school because he never went to the doctor. So he never got routine eye exams from elementary school, middle school. He was legally blind, never saw the board whatsoever. And he'd always hate school and we didn't even know, but that's just like, and that's not an uncommon story. Like, I, I mean, I know my teeth are straight now, but I just had, <laughs> I just underwent like 27 dental procedures because I never went to the dentist as a kid. Like we didn't have the money. Um, so it wasn't until I got to college and I was forced to see a, a surgeon just because I, I had a science major that I saw a black surgeon. I was like, man, that reminded me, that reminded me a lot of my dad. And then I put like, you know, two and two together. I was like, well, maybe I can, maybe I can do this. Maybe I, and it, like, so I chased the entire, the entire dream of medicine was just to be a community leader. Like my dad I had nothing to do with like, oh, I want to take care of all the like patients. Oh, I want to, like, I love the nervous system. I do. I love nervous system. I love the brain. I love our patients, but it all started with me um, just wanting to do community work um, uh, like my dad. Now I feel you on that, man. Cause if, even if you go back and look at my, personal statements I've written over the years, a lot of them are going to start off with this general idea of, hey, I want to be a leader. I want to impact the community. You know, I'm the same way. I love medicine. I'm, I'm a poem crit doc. I love what I do, of course, especially, you know, this past couple of years with COVID, you know, I, I love that opportunity to serve. Absolutely. But all of it really started off as the idea of how can I impact the community, right? That, that's what it all really starts out with. And again, man, the, you know, kudos to your dad and what you're saying. And I hope the listeners are, are following this and the viewers are following this idea of, you know, the role of having a, a, a father, a black male father involved in the community so is so critical, especially in those communities where, where that where you're not seeing very many of them. It's so critical. Another thing which you said, which is, is really interesting, which I've noticed, I noticed just a lot of successful people um, say, say this. Now, I wonder if there's some sort of trend in here. Um, a lot of people, some people come on this podcast, talk about it. A lot of successful athletes talk about it, about this idea of their parents, um, being there for people in the community, like like you just mm -hmm. said, you see somebody on the couch, a drunk person on the couch. Like you hear that a lot of times. People say, oh yeah, our house was a house where everybody came to, or, you know, my parents, people stay with us for a while. Like even, even me growing up, I remember like in our household, like my dad would let different people come, you know, stay with us for a long period of time, mm -hmm. sometimes to kind of live with us for a little bit of time. Like Absolutely, that seems yeah. to be a common theme. So tell me about that. that. That has to play some role. I don't know what it is, but that's got to play some role in development of leaders. You know, I I don't know. I think my dad just cared. I think that's a strong, I mean, any great leader, one of the, one of the most important things they have to do is actually care about the people they're leading. And so like my dad just, he cared about the community. Like he cared about, you know, kids and him having structure and this, even, you know, it was like football, whatever. Um, like I said, not a lot, not a lot of these kids were getting any structure outside of whatever they had to do at, at school. And then they go home and they're living in a broken home and they can't do homework, whatever. So this was a, like the, the main structure, fellowship, encouragement, um, camaraderie that they ever got. And so like even little things like he, we didn't have a lot of money, but he would be, he would pay for their pads for the football association or, you know, obviously like, like I said, we didn't live in the greatest neighborhood and like a lot of parents, they were working uh, like late nights. So they, they didn't pick up their kids from these football practices and things. So like my dad, even though practice ended at like six, we, he would drive and like, we didn't have enough money to find gas money. He'd drive back and forth all over the city, taking like 20 kids home um, because they didn't have a ride. And obviously, like I said, we didn't have a lot of money, but he, he thought that that was, that's more important that like the whole community it, it, as a, as a whole is more important than any one person. And so 
That's like he dope. had that same idea, but he he also had that same idea in the um in the family. And that's because, like I said, he came from sharecroppers. They didn't have anything. Like they had literally nothing. Everything they owned was owned by some somebody else, and anything they did have, they were indebted to. And so um all they had was family to take care of them. And so he had that same, you know, mentality um when he raised us. And it like, I mean, it was just like little stuff. He would if my brother came home and somehow he was in a fight, but somehow I didn't get into the fight, then I was in trouble. <laughs> That's not what my dad was. It was all about family taking care of family. Yeah, I can appreciate that. So um, of course, definitely got a shout out to to the mom. So tell me, tell me about your mother. So my mom, so my mom, I'm biracial. My mom's my mom's white. Her family's from West Virginia. Unfortunately, like I don't know a lot about my mom's family because um, like this is early. This is like in the like early 80s and stuff like that when um like late 70s, early 80s. So like biracial um marriages like that, like I mean, it means it seems like normal now, but that wasn't that wasn't normal. So um actually like my mom's family actually kicked her out the home. Um and when she met my dad, I'm like, she went to go live with my dad. And my dad at the time, like they, like I said, they went through times where they were homeless. Um, but she eventually just moved, he had a boat and they sold, they traded a boat for a house. And we lived in that house at, you know, like little whatever house that was but um yeah he just she just moved in with him after her family kind of like lightweight disowned her um for being with my dad or wanting to be with my dad so I don't really I don't have a huge um uh influence from like my mom's my mom's family but my mom was amazing I mean like I mean, obviously being in the hood and like being, <laughs> being a white woman in the middle of the hood is like, and it's kind of like, out, you know, but she, she didn't care at all. Like, I remember one time, like she went up to a group of like, I mean, obviously these are like, I mean, whatever they, I mean, I, they're not a gang, but you know, whatever people on the corner and like, we were walking by and we were just kids, like five, six years old. And she started yelling at them because like they were using the N word. And she was like, I don't want like, you know, I don't want my kids to look bad when, you know, white people walk around and they see you guys using that language because they don't make them, you know, they're going to look down on you, unfortunately. And so like she would just walk up to people and try to like, um, like impress upon them how other, uh, how society viewed them. And like, obviously people would just roll their eyes. They were like, okay, whatever. That's just like Mr. Palmer's wife. <laughs> but that's just how she was. And like, that's how she raised us. Um, she was also, you know, big about like trying to do things for other people. So um, no, she was definitely a huge, and like, she worked so hard. Like my mom, she'd work a few jobs. Um, and while my dad was working. So, you know, they were some of the hardest working people I've, I've ever, you know, had a chance to meet. And so that was a huge influence on me. It's huge, man. Kids seeing parents working hard, man. Kids seeing parents working hard. I've got one of my mentors and buddies um, was the EP on our Black Men and White Coast documentary as well. I remember, so, you know, he's done well. He's very financially successful, right? Um, but, you know, he'll tell me from time to time that he'll try to find stuff to do because he thinks it's important for a, a boy or a girl, really, a child to see their parents working, right? So he'll, he'll, he'll go try to do something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, now tell me, so... When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? We'll be right back. Ooh. I want them bad like a doctor, yeah. Only do it like flogger, yeah. I'm kicking flare with no saga, yeah. Hey, I like them blues. I might go Janet like Jackson. I got the margin, yeah. It's all about progression. Life is like a blessing. Everything goes Black Man and White like Coach merch Ooh. found at bmwc.store. Yeah. When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? Is it after you got to college or was it as a child, did you have an inkling of it? No, I had no, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I didn't really know what to do when I was, I mean, I just went to college to play football. It's not like I, I thought I was going to go to the NFL. And like I said, my, my dad didn't graduate high school. So there wasn't any like a huge push, like, oh, you got to go to college. When I got to college, um, I, I went to a school to literally play football and I got into like a, I got into altercation and, um, got actually kicked off the team and then lost my scholarship and my dad went ballistic on that that side <laughs> but uh, right I mean I had yeah. a scholarship I was like oh in college and like now I don't but um anyway I, I transferred to a to a smaller school and um that smaller school had a lot of like pre-health pre-pt pre-farm and um at the time when I got there, I was undecided, but I was like, well, everyone, I just want to pick a major. And I picked alchemist just because it was a rapper named alchemist. I didn't even like, I never took chemistry, never took biology, didn't know anything. <laughs> but I was like, whatever, they're forcing me to pick a major. So whatever, like, I don't know what it is. Let's go into it. And so I'm serious. Is that, is that true? I, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, when I, when I hit, <laughs> when I hit <laughs> you know, when I went to those Al classes, alchemist, like, they, I mean, mob I deep. Alchemist. Yeah. 
Mob Deep Alchemist, Rap. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like, whatever. I mean, it, at the time, I was just like, that was just my mindset. So I failed the majority of classes. Like when I was in college, I had like a 1.8 the majority of the time. Oh, wow. But like I said, there were a lot of like, I didn't want to be like, even though I go to the science, like we go to organic chemistry lab, whatever. I didn't read the books or like study, but I'd still go to the class. And then we, you know, we'd work in pairs. And <laughs> and then another, like, I remember one time in class, another pair where, where they were asking us questions like, hey, do you know what the next step? And then one of the people in the class were like, don't ask him. He doesn't even, he doesn't even like read the book. He's not going to know. And I was like, oh man, that hit me. Like, well, of course I don't, but like, don't just say that. Like, it's disrespectful. <laughs> um but anyway I wanted to be like I, like it was a like a white catholic university I wanted to be like the other student just like anybody wants to fit in that's just like a normal thing so when all these pre like all these science majors were like you know pre-farm um pre-pt pre-med I just chose like pre-med because I didn't want to be any different and people already thought I was stupid so I was like whatever um and then part being a part of that program the uh, university made us go and like observe a, a you know go and do some sort of like community or like volunteer time and that's how I had the opportunity to see um, the black surgeon when I saw that black surgeon I'm like okay yeah this is like I mean this reminded me a lot of my dad this is what I want to do and that was the first time that I decided like okay maybe medicine's for me like maybe maybe I can do this but like at the time I had like a 1.8 GPA. It wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like I was going or doing or moving anything. It was just, I had the thought that I like, Oh, maybe I could be a doctor. Um, I believe one, one point. That's when, it, that's when it first started when I was like, and I was like, Oh man, maybe I, maybe I could be a, become a doctor. Maybe like, maybe they're not just like all lames with white coats and don't do anything. Like maybe I could I actually <laughs> like, I could do that. I never seen any doctors. So I was like, whatever, maybe I could, maybe I could do that. I like that, man. I like that because a lot of people, well, I don't, wait, I don't like the one point. I don't like all that stuff, but I like the fact that you oh, happens, okay. man. People go to college and like, okay, perfect example. Like when I went to college, I, like I never had my like room, I never like bed. Like when I went to college, I had my room, I had my bed. Like, what do you expect? Of course, I'm going to party and go crazy. Like, yeah. like, of course, it was the first time I ever had anything of my, my like to myself, any time to myself. Like, it's like you it's like what they say you can take somebody out of a certain situation but if you don't change your mindset you're not changing anything you're just changing the location that person's still exactly the same so um i ran into that a few times in my life just because my mindset hadn't changed oh yeah that, yeah that's definitely that's definitely real i like i like how i like the story the particular part is it seems as though the white coat changed your life like see this idea of hey you saw it and that changed your life right i love that thing um, I saw, I saw a black man in a position of power that people looked up to. And I thought that was a community leader. And it reminded me of my dad. That is what like I saw. And it wasn't like he was doing like, oh, my God, he's a surgeon. No, it was just like how people looked up to him, how he like comforted people. I like he walked to the hallway and people just look at him like that. That I thought was more important than just ever touching a patient. Just just like when you go like I'm sure you go to um, you go into like schools and stuff like that. You probably wear your white coat. It's not, it's not anything that you say that's really important. This is the kids when they, when they see you walk and they, and they see like, oh, is that, is that really a doctor? Like that is what's really important. That, that whole change in the mindset of like, oh, that's actually something that's a possibility. Like, and so that, I mean, that was really what was important to me. It, it changed my mindset, seeing somebody like that, that I, I envisioned that maybe I could do that, right? Maybe, I, maybe, maybe, you know, whatever. Um, and that's what, that's what changed everything. Or at least that's what changed my mind. So... So that that's what got that's what kind of got your mindset seeing somebody in a position where you thought that you know you want to have that same type of you know um, influence society. I, I I love that. Now tell me, how did you turn around from that one point eight and all that stuff? <laughs> how did you turn? Because you got your neurosurgeon, right? So how did you turn around? And, and, and I want people to understand this. And of course, you're gonna get into this. I want people to understand this. Just because you you have a rocky start because you don't do so great. And you're like, I mean, your story is unique, but it's not that unique, right? I, I can tell you a few people who have very similar stories in terms of, you know, the struggle and coming up. So people, kids need to understand this. When you go to college and you have a rough start, it doesn't mean give up, right? It, does, it doesn't mean quit, right? It just means, hey, if you want to do this, you got to refocus, find the right people. So tell us about that, how you were able to turn it around. So, I mean, after, after I saw, so after I saw a surgeon, um, right, I think, I mean, like I said, I didn't know how to go about it. It, but um there was all usually schools have like a pre-med advisor or something like a gatekeeper per se into medicine and we had this um we had this woman called dr caplia um and i mean she was such a stern professor i like you know how like when you're in, like back in college you try to figure out like 
the classes would come out and you try to rush and try to pick the classes that were the professors were the e- like not easiest but like you know whatever um everybody skipped out of capitalist class because they didn't want to have her as a professor i actually favored her oh. class twice um before but she was like the medical advisor so i printed off my transcript and took it to her and um you know honestly to be 100 percent honest with you just knowing myself she would have been like you know what aaron i don't uh, you know you failed a couple of times i don't think you can do this honestly i don't know what i would have done i probably would have whatever who knows what i would have done um but i certainly like, do you think that i'd be a good doctor and she said like absolutely absolutely i think you could be a good doctor i think that you know you have shown certain times in class where you can you know pick up the material very quickly and other times you just like either you know fall on your face and so if you can link those times where you do well together then you'll be you know not an issue whatsoever and so she's like i think you're gonna have to try much harder um, because I think you have it in you, but um, I absolutely do, do think you could become a good doctor. So um, to her credit, like I said, I went to like a like private, like white university and, you know, black male coming to her, her, her office um, with a 1.8 transcript and I failed her class twice. And she said that I could become a good doctor. Man, so, shout out to that, man. I know. I, don't know. If I had one of those little push button clap things. I pushed that clap. That little clap and you know the crazy thing is when I was walking out, she was like, hey, actually, you know what? Come back here for a second. She took off two books off her shelf. She's like, these are the two books in my class. I don't want to hear anything about you failing my classes because you don't have the books anymore. <laughs> and so she, she met with me books. like yeah she gave me the books to her class she met with me and you know people are like oh i met with them like every month for you i met with her like once a week twice a week for like two years um because after i like after i decided to do that um like my grades were you know horrible i had to um i had to retake all those classes and i retaking all those classes um i couldn't play football and take all those classes so um I stopped playing football. And um, when you stop playing football, the scholarship is gone. And so I had to I had to pay for my own, you know, pay for my own school in. And like I said, it was a Catholic university. So the tuition was like 35, 30, like forty thousand um, dollars. Had I, you know, thinking I probably would have transferred to another school, but like I wasn't. And I, w- I mean, I was just trying to get into another university. And so after I started to go there, what, I, unless you pay off your balance, you can't go to a different school. So I was like locked in. To that university and so what I, the plan that me and Caplia came up with was to work for you know a semester and then um go to school for a semester or drop out for a semester and then go back to school for a semester on and off so every six months i quote unquote drop out and go back to <laughs> go back to school and um and what we because otherwise it take like eight years nine years to do all that in a um and graduate so what we did was we compressed all of the like i took I take like 30 credits in a semester, which is almost like two and a half times just because I need to make up. And after you start taking enough credits, they would be like, they would just add on for free. Like after you got to like 20 or like 16 credits, the other credits would be free. So oh, um, I would real? take as many credits as I possibly could. Is that, and is that, is that just that institution? Or is that something I think it was just that institution. Wow. Um, and I would just like, I'd load all the classes and I was taking like 20, 30 credits. Um, and that's how I got. And I, you know, I, like I was focused. I was, you know, paying for school now. And um, you start studying different when you start paying for your own tuition is what I found out. <laughs> that and um, the other thing that I had to do um, was so like it wasn't like I was going to make 15 to like 20 grand every semester, like working like I worked at any Ann's flipping pretzels, like Mike Prohondo, like detailing cars. Um and I worked at um, Hollister and I wasn't enough, like I wasn't making enough money to pay for my tuition. So like, I, honestly, I, I sold the car that I had to help pay for tuition. And um, it was like a 88, 89 Hyundai, um, it was a piece of crap car. Like we had to put seats in it, brakes, everything in it. But anyway, I bought it for $300 and I, we, I sold it for 900. And so like, I was like, oh man, $900, like I can pay off whatever, I go a few more weeks. Cause they, that's how it was. Like you could go, go in and ask the uh, financial aid leads. I would just be paying enough to go back like for a week or two weeks. And I'm like, <laughs> like, like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. That's a hustle, man. You got to do what you got to do. But, um, but I like, like my dad, like I said, my dad used to fix stuff. And when I was um, like, my dad would drop me off. I know it sounds great. My dad would drop me off like 4.30 five o'clock in the morning when class like middle school or, or elementary school started at like seven or eight because no, no, whoa, 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 whoa. so you a middle school student you getting dropped off at like five in the morning for school yeah yeah because you he you had just, a, you just sit there and wait yeah yeah i mean yeah for school yeah um 
And wow. honestly, I mean, there was there was another uh, kid, a girl there. I don't know what her family situation, but like we didn't ever talk, but she got dropped off at like 432. So I wasn't there alone. It was some other kid there, too. Um, but anyway, he we dropped off that early because he would um, he drop us off really early. Then he go to um, like richer neighborhoods or affluent neighborhoods and get off washers and dryers off the curb, fix them or put them in the truck. After work, he'd fix them and then sell them to use appliance stores and make more money. And so that's why he would always, he just dropped me off in the morning before he made his rounds or whatever. So, um, but anyway, a light bulb went off, like maybe I could just buy, sell and like buy, fix and resell cars. Um, so I started doing that in college and like, I like for a semester, like one semester, I would like bought, like sold 23 cars. Um, I think for a year, I probably bought and sold maybe like 40, 50 cars in a year. Um, uh-huh. Now, sidebar, that's illegal if you don't have a, you don't have a dealer's license, <laughs> but at the time I need the money. Um, and it was the quickest way to get some money. So that's how I paid for school. I'd like, I'd, uh, um, I'd fit as many credits as I possibly could grind as hard as I could for that semester try to do as much, you know, um, make up as much, you know, lost ground as well, try to graduate. And then I drop out and then I would, um, you know, buy and sell cars. My brother did it too. We just like flip cars and try to stack up enough money to help like pay for bills and like, um, pay for school. That's how I pay for college. Man, that's a that's a hustle. So yeah. anybody listening to this right now, zero excuse. You just gave that might I've heard a lot of wild stuff on this podcast, man. That might be one of the the most hustleless, 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 hustle thing I've ever heard on this podcast. And you know what crazy thing is? I almost I almost didn't go back to school. Hey, what's up, fam? This is Dr. Daniel. Thank y'all for checking out part one. Um, it was a powerful, powerful story, wasn't it? But anyway, make sure next week you come on back for part two of Dr. Palmer's story. And um, we're going to get into how he got into neurosurgery. And it is a story you do not want to miss. So come on back next week and we'll see you then. Peace. Ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stepping. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, if you want to go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. Stop playing around, really got a wreck, ain't playing around. Black men, white yeah. coat, shit, we up right now, yo.